Thank you for tuning in to the Weekly Word, Gracious Savior Church's online video devotional for those of you who can't join us for Sunday worship every week at 9.30 a.m. At our physical worship service, you'll enjoy live worship, community, and belonging. So if you live in the Vale Valley, we would love to see you there. Our mission is loving Jesus, each other, and all people. It's a huge mission. So if you see anything on the screen that interests you right now, go ahead and reach out to us. You can go to our website, graciousavior.org, or email us at graciousaviorchurch at gmail.com. We are still doing mountaintop worship services at Beaver Creek at Spruce Saddle. It happens every once in a while, so reach out to Matt, our worship and high school director, to learn how you can help. You can email him at matt.graciousaviorchurch at gmail.com. We're updating our church directory, so please send us an updated photo of you or your family, and that way we can add it into this new fancy pictorial directory. You can email that at graciousaviorchurch at gmail.com. Holy Week is coming up, so we have three things that you need to know about. One, on Maundy Thursday... That's Thursday, April 6th at 6 p.m. We will be having communion and watching the Passion of the Christ. Good Friday service is a much bigger deal. We encourage everyone to come at 7 p.m. on Friday, April 7th. Our Easter services are happening on Easter Sunday, April 9th. We have two services, one at 7 a.m. It's more of a traditional service in the atrium followed by a waffle breakfast. Very quaint, very intimate, very meaningful. Our more typical Easter Sunday service is at 9.30 a.m. It's going to be followed by a potluck and an egg hunt for the little kids. Thank you for tuning in to the Weekly Word. I'm Josh, and I get to be the Kids Minister and Outreach Director here at Gracious Savior Church. And here is a message from God's Word from Pastor Jason. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We are back in the Gospel of Matthew. Specifically, we're on Thursday of Holy Week. It is the day of Jesus' arrest, one day before his crucifixion. And from Sunday of Holy Week through Wednesday of this week, Jesus has been teaching. He's been surrounded by crowds. He's been confronting his enemies. It's been a very intense week. So let's jump into the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 26. This is where we're at. Verse 17. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And this is the gospel of our Lord. So here we are. It's Thursday of Holy Week, and Jesus is celebrating the Passover with his disciples. And uh, this Thursday evening, it's one of the few times 
where Jesus has been by himself with just his disciples this week. It's been a very, very busy week. The Gospels tell us that Jesus celebrated this Passover in an upper room in Jerusalem. Which upper room? We don't know, but he was in an upper room in Jerusalem. And normally, you would celebrate the Passover with family and close friends. But these guys, they've been together for over three years. They're as good as family, which makes Judas's betrayal all the more despicable. I'm on the wrong page. Sorry about that. <laughs> Typically, the host of, of the Passover meal would be the head of the household of the home where it's being celebrated. But they don't own this home. And so Jesus is the host. And the disciples, his friends, are his guests. The Passover meal is a fairly long meal. It can take place over oh, close to three hours long. And I imagine a meal that long with a bunch of guys. The meat's going first, of course. There's a lot of talking and, and joking and laughing in between the prayers and the songs and the food of the Passover meal. But at one point during the Passover meal, Jesus, he, he lifts, up, lifts up the matzah. And he's expected to say a prayer as the host, a prayer something like this. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Malek Ahaha Olam. Asher Kitshanu Bit Matzvotav Vit Zavanu A Akilat Matzah. Which is very bad Hebrew, but it means approximately. Blessed are you, Lord or God, King of the universe, who commands us to eat matzah. That's what they expect Jesus to say. But he doesn't. Instead, he holds up the matzah and he says, take and eat. This is my body. He breaks it and he passes out to the disciples. This is weird. I imagine the disciples looking at each other and whispering, he's not doing it right. That's not what he's supposed to say. And did he just say body? What is going on here? But it gets more weird. Later, Jesus takes the cup of wine in front of him. They would have all had their own cups of wine, but he takes his cup. And he's expected to say a prayer again, something like, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei, Borei Pri Hagafen which means, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the vine. But Jesus does not say this. Instead, he says, take and drink, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. What is going on here? Jesus is not doing it right. He's doing Passover wrong, which is all right. Because at this point, he's not doing Passover. He's doing a completely new meal. The Passover meal was designed to remind the Jews to remember and to celebrate God's redemption, God's saving, God's deliverance of them from slavery when they were slaves in Egypt around 1400 BC. And the meal reminded them of all the plagues that God inflicted on the Egyptians and on Pharaoh to convince Pharaoh to let his people go. No other person in history has had such a front row seat to the power and authority of God and refused to repent as Pharaoh did. And so after nine horrible plagues, God sends one last plague to free his people. This will be the death of the firstborn son. And so that the Israelites would be spared from this plague, God said, take a lamb, a perfect lamb, and kill it. And take the blood of that lamb and use it to paint the door frames of your homes. And so that when the angel of death came to strike the homes of the Egyptians, it would pass over the homes of the Israelites. And the Israelites celebrated Passover meal ever since to remind them of God's saving of them. 
So Jesus in this meal, this new meal, is declaring that in the same way that the lamb delivered the Israelites, Jesus would deliver Israel. And not just Israel, the whole world. But he throws in an interesting twist. He throws in forgiveness. And Passover is not typically about forgiveness. It's about saving, it's about deliverance, it's about redemption, but not technically about forgiveness. So Jesus is combining in another Jewish holy day called Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur means the day of atonement. And Yom Kippur to this day is the highest of holy days for the Jews. Back in Jesus's day, it involved multiple sacrifices. It was the one time of the year where the high priest could enter the part of the temple that was called the holy, most holy place or holy of holies. And the high priest would enter and he would take the blood of a sacrificed bull and he would paint and sprinkle that blood on what was called the mercy seat, which sat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. The imagery was clear. It was as if God was looking down from heaven and looking down into his place, his throne room in the temple in the Holy of Holies. And there God would see in the Ark of the Covenant the Ten Commandments, those commandments which his people had broken over and over and over again. But on this day, on Yom Kippur, he would only see the blood of the sacrifice. And the blood of the sacrifice had covered over the law. And God's people would be forgiven of their sin. Jesus is taking these two important events, these two holy days for Israel, and declaring that his death on the cross fulfills them both. Jesus is the ultimate Savior who redeems and saves all of his people Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice and who by his blood, all people can be forgiven of their sin. And this meal, this Lord's Supper reminds us of both. It is Jesus who is the Passover lamb who delivers his people. It is Jesus who is the sacrifice whose blood atones for the sin of all the people. And this new meal combines them both. And so like the Passover, when we receive the Lord's Supper, we remember. We remember and we celebrate what Jesus Christ has done for you and for me. And in this Lord's Supper, we remember and we celebrate and we receive, just like Yom Kippur, God's forgiveness for you. The meal, it does what it says it does. The Lord's Supper, in one way, is a performative speech act. It does what it says it does. A great example is at a wedding. You know, the pastor stands up and says, I now pronounce you husband and wife. And at that moment, they are husband and wife. Why? Because it's been declared so. It's a performative speech act. If you watch a lot of baseball, you know what a strike is? A strike is whatever the empire says it is. When the empire says strike one, it's strike one. He declares it so. And so in the same way, in the Lord's Supper, we eat the bread, we drink the fruit of the vine for the forgiveness of our sin. Why? Because Jesus declared it so. It does what he says it does. So not only does this meal, this Lord's Supper, not only does it remind us of Jesus' sacrifice and love, not only does it share Jesus' forgiveness for you, it also celebrates us, the, the people of Jesus together. And the best meals and celebrations, they all do this. Think of 4th of July. What do you eat on the 4th of July? Hot dogs. And what do you celebrate on the 4th of July? Freedom. We eat hot dogs and we celebrate freedom on the 4th of July because we're Americans and that's what we do. We may also celebrate high cholesterol in the process, but that's okay. It's a side effect. We celebrate hot dogs and freedom. Thanksgiving is a better example. What do you eat on Thanksgiving? Turkey. 
What do you celebrate on Thanksgiving? You celebrate the opportunity to give thanks. It's a time to give thanks, most often for the people who are with you, for the people that you wish were with you for this Thanksgiving meal. The best meals celebrate us. And the Lord's Supper was never designed to be a, a personal thing, just you and Jesus and some a little bit of wine, a little bit of bread. The pandemic forced us into that for a little bit. We're not doing that anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. The Lord's Supper, it celebrates Jesus, but it also celebrates community. It celebrates us. A new Israel, a new community, a community that reaches back 2,000 years to that first Lord's Supper and stretches forward to heaven itself. And so we, the church and saints from ages past, and perhaps for ages to come, are a people, a community of Jesus living together because of his death and resurrection for you, but also for us. And so I want to encourage you to find a Christian church in your area. If you can, a Lutheran church that really celebrates the full meaning of the Lord's Supper would be, would be great. Uh, you go to lcms.org and you can find a Lutheran church in your area. But I want to encourage you to be a part of a community. If you can, if you're not able and you're watching this <clears throat> from home and we're so glad we can provide this for you. But if you're anywhere around community, a Christian community that celebrates Jesus and his presence in the Lord's Supper, wow, that's a special thing. It's a gift. It's a gift to you. And as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we, we remember Jesus and his deliverance for us. We receive Jesus and his forgiveness for us. And we renew this community and the gift of us. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this meal that you've given to us. We've been given lots of great meals, Lord. Fourth of July and Thanksgiving. But this meal, it's the best because it does the most. This meal reminds us of you. This meal shares your presence and your forgiveness with us. This meal celebrates us and the gift we are to each other and Lord, the gift that you are to us. We thank you for it. Thank you for your death. Thank you for your resurrection. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, may it guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus, our Lord, for life everlasting. 